industry on parade. A pictorial review of events in business and industry produced each week by the National Association of Manufacturers. Pulling 103 freight cars up a grade on the rugged run from Green River, Wyoming to Ogden, Utah, the first gas turbine electric locomotive used in freight service in the nation. One of the 10 4,500 horsepower behemoths built by General Electric for the Union Pacific Railroad. The 86-foot locomotive burns up a low-grade fuel that spins a turbine to drive four generators. Each of the generators powers two electric motors, one for each of the eight axles on the running gear. Air passes through the power plant at the rate of 150,000 cubic feet a minute. If the air supply were cut off for even a few seconds, a vacuum would build up inside strong enough to cave in the sides. To guard against this, there's a set of spring-loaded pop-open doors in the roof. Those aren't windows on the sides, but air filters. The locomotive is about twice as efficient as a diesel engine of comparable weight. In addition, the fuel it burns is much less expensive, and maintenance costs are also lower. In the century-long evolution of better railroad motive power for better railroad service, the new locomotives set an important milestone in American transportation. In America, the overwhelming majority of employers want and are doing their sincere best to work in harmony with their employees. American employers strive to provide the best kind of working conditions, treating employees considerately and doing everything possible to preserve their dignity in all situations. Employers continually seek ways to make their employees' work more satisfying and to give them the greatest opportunity for personal advancement. And employers always try to pay the highest wages possible in the light of particular business problems. These are some of the reasons America has the greatest employer-employee team in the world. At the point where George Rogers Clark built a fort that later grew to become the city of Louisville, a company whose history goes back not quite so far, manufactures bedding in a way that would make the old explorer stare in amazement. For in the old days, a mattress was a shapeless bag of straw or feathers. Now it's a complicated arrangement of strong fabric, carbon steel springs, cotton linters, foam latex, and other materials put together by skilled hands and fabulous machines, like those in action here at the Kentucky Sanitary Bedding Company. The mattress covers are cut, stitched, hemmed, and bound on a battery of unique sewing machines. This one, for example, quilts the border to reinforce it and help the mattress hold its shape and also to prevent ventilators and handles from pulling out. The border is joined to the top panel and the seam reinforced with rayon binding. Meanwhile, the skeletons for mattresses are arriving at the receiving department. How many mattress springs would you say have been pressed together in this shipment? A full dozen, and if they weren't opened under pressure, they might take off through the roof. In another part of the plant, cotton stock is blended into a uniform mixture, cleaned of all foreign matter, and garneted. The cotton fibers are interlaced into a strong, smooth web, and built up in many layers to become resilient cotton felt. Cotton felt is cut to mattress size and folded automatically. Now we're ready to start building a mattress. On top of the inner springs goes a sisal insulator that will prevent the sleeper from feeling the coils. This is secured to the inner spring unit by a large moving sewing machine. In addition to mattresses, Kentucky Sanitary Bedding produces related items like box springs, sofa beds, and studio couches. Over the insulator goes a thick bat of cotton felt, the mattresses upholstery. 
And when that's fixed in place, on goes the quality damask cover. The other side gets the same treatment for, of course, the modern mattress is reversible. Although the company's products are sold primarily in Kentucky and Indiana, the firm is a member of CERTA Associates, a group of 39 bedding manufacturers coast to coast who share advertising expenses, buy raw materials jointly, and otherwise cut costs. A perfect sleeper mattress produced here is identical with those turned out in the plant of any of the other 38 member companies. After the cover is closed, the mattress goes to the finishing department where button tufts are put on, like this. Box springs are assembled with the same care and attention to detail. The springs are held under tension while the fabric is fastened to the frame. In the past few years, there's been tremendous interest in the use of foam rubber in cushions and mattresses. A mattress made of the material with cores for ventilation and proper support requires no inner springs. Just another of the ways in which bedding makers of the land manage to make it ever easier for us to turn in at night and ever more tempting to linger in bed in the morning. A young lady about to make a very small purchase, a phonograph needle. Small purchase? Small in size, perhaps, but more science and skill and time have gone into its manufacture than once went into an entire phonograph and the record that was played on it. Here at Permo Incorporated in Chicago, the intricate process of transforming various alloys into a minute precision instrument begins with the drawing, straightening, and cutting off of wire for the needle shanks. For high fidelity, gun barrel straightness is essential even when the shanks are only about three times as thick as a human hair. While the phonograph needle is the heart of the record player, the point is the heart of the needle. Our industry on parade camera moves in for a magnified close-up of the tiny pellets of rare metal alloys, four or five times as costly as gold, that will become the points of these top quality needles. The points are electrically welded to the shanks. Because of the close tolerances required, many of the machines and equipment used here were designed and built by Permo's own engineers. After welding, each tip must be individually and carefully ground to a sharp point, with the operator checking on the progress of the work through a magnifying glass. Machines called centerless grinders reduce the diameter of the shanks and give them special shapes. The grinding has left edges too sharp, and in some cases the points are not the precise size. To round off those sharp edges and bring the radius of the points to the proper thousandths of an inch, the needles now are tumbled. In a small drum, they're rotated with shot and an abrasive liquid for a predetermined period, some for just a few hours, others for several days, depending on how fine the point must be. For 78 RPM records, it must measure three thousandths of an inch, but for the micro groove, 33 and a third, or 45 RPM records, it must be a mere one thousandth of an inch. An identifying card on each drum indicates how long that drum should be tumbled. The shanks are further machined in accordance with the findings of Permo's extensive research into the proper ways and means of reproducing high fidelity sound. For example, the method of securing the needle to the pickup arm of the record player is very important. For if there isn't a completely tight connection, the sound reproduced will be poor, and both needle and record will suffer. Permo cuts a V-shaped groove, into which the set screw will fit snugly. Then the needle is clinched into its protective sheath. And still, the long, involved manufacturing process is not complete. Now the needles will be plated to protect against corrosion, 
which could weaken them and also affect their all-important dimensions. The plating is done by electrolysis. A flow of current in the chemical bath causes molecules of brass to attach themselves to the needles. Although there have been inspections at every step, the final inspection is made through a magnifier that would reveal the slightest defect or imperfection. Screw needles get an additional inspection on the shadow graph, which blows up their contours 1,000 times. Finally, the finished needles are individually packaged for shipment. Why all this care in the making of a phonograph needle? Well, when you consider that because of its tiny size, the point of a needle undergoes pressure of 25,000 pounds per square inch and temperatures as high as 2,000 degrees Fahrenheit, you'll agree we've come a long way since the day of the old hand-operated gramophone. Record players, records, and needles, all advancing steadily in a healthy atmosphere of freedom and competition. More than one half of America's 61 million working men and women today are employed in business and industries that didn't even exist 50 years ago. These new frontiers of work and achievement have been opened up largely in industries such as chemicals, electronics, automotive and atomic energy, all resulting from our unmatched research programs and our genius at invention, all possible only under our free individual and economic system. Our nation's constantly expanding industrial and business horizons offer high hope for the youth of our country. America is still the land of opportunity. Let's keep it that way. A Midwestern snowstorm. Cars galore stalled on a slippery hill as their wheels spin uselessly. One car pulls out from the pack and moves steadily up the incline. The reason? A new kind of tire, which, instead of the conventional tread, has 10,000 tiny blocks of rubber on its gripping surface. The test car on the right stops easily, thanks to the tires developed at the B.F. Goodrich plant in Akron, where the road tests were duplicated in the lab. Tire was driven onto wet safety glass, below which slow motion cameras were set up to show how the tiny blocks in the tread open and close, wiping away the water to provide a quick skidless stop. In Florida, the road tests continued on the tubeless tire that defies skidding, seals, punctures, and protects against blowouts. Mounted on the black car only, the tires stood out in every kind of competition. Years of research pay off in new safety on the highway. And if you're out in the rain and looking for a place to strike a match, just pull up to a quick stop. on parade. A pictorial review of events in business and industry produced each week by the National Association of Manufacturers. Not an atom bomb, just one drum of gasoline. Imagine what this geyser of flame would do to a building. Was it TNT? No, merely dust. Any number of inflammable dusts can go off the same way. All these fires and explosions are part of the tests and experiments conducted the year round at the factory mutual laboratories at Norwood, Massachusetts by the engineering division of an association of mutual fire insurance companies specializing in the protection of industrial plants. 
Here, materials found in such plants and suspected of being hazardous are analyzed scrupulously by scientists skilled at detecting dangerous liquids, dusts, fibers, or other substances that might put a factory out of production. Industries submit hundreds of samples for testing each year. Fire protective equipment also is tested. Various types of fire extinguishers, for example, are hung here for prolonged periods to determine how corrosion affects their operation. The extinguishers are chilled to 40 degrees below zero and then given a trial to show up any possible deficiencies at extreme temperatures. The key to good fire protection in a factory is a sprinkler system. But there are sprinklers and sprinklers. This one is set up in an oven where carefully controlled heat shows whether it will go off automatically when the mercury reaches the proper level. Not just the sprinkler head, but the whole system is put to the test. Sprinklers that have been installed in plants for a long time without being put to use are often sent here for a tryout to ensure they haven't been rendered useless by corrosion, heavily contaminated air, or other unusual conditions. And this is building 18. It almost looks as though it's been gutted by fire. Actually, the fire, though of industrial scale, is under control at all times. What they're doing here is staging a battle between a raging gasoline fire and a new sprinkler of improved design. Will the flames consume the wooden crib, or will it be saved by the sprinkler? All the suspense of a mystery story, but you don't have to wait until next week for the answer. The improved sprinkler wins out. The wood is only slightly burned. How many of the 25,000 plants covered by the Associated Factory Mutual Fire Insurance Companies will be spared serious losses thanks to this experiment? or thanks to any of the numerous other experiments in which the laboratories seek better ways of controlling fires and explosions, those natural phenomena that can do mankind such great good or such great harm. The factory mutual laboratories have helped bring fire insurance costs down to their present all-time low levels. But even more important, they've helped keep our industrial plants humming at a time when they're more vital than ever to our very existence. The right of a man to worship God according to the dictates of his own conscience has been a fundamental principle of the American way. To true believers, the teachings of their religion provide the highest authority for faith and conduct. When a man has to accept some other authority for his moral behavior, as he must under a dictatorship, the place and validity of his religion are destroyed. From the beginning, America has beckoned to men and women of all religions. We must preserve in this land the right of every individual to discover God in his own way. Mealtime for a healthy little two-year-old who's already well acquainted with a staple of the American diet, breakfast food, formerly served in only one or two forms and chiefly in the wintertime. Now, as at the Quaker Oats Company plant in Cedar Rapids, Iowa, the rich grains of the Midwest farmlands are transformed into the widest imaginable variety of nutritious breakfast foods for every palate and every season of the year. Freight cars full of wheat, oats, corn, and other grains arrive here and are emptied as you and I might empty a box of cereal by picking them up and shaking them. As the processors of many millions of bushels of grain every year, food industries like Quaker Oats have devoted much costly research to improving the strains grown on our farms to the financial benefit of America's farmers and the improved health of the entire world. By conveyor belt, it goes to storage bins to be drawn out as needed. The accent throughout the huge building is on speedy mechanical handling, for that means greatest cleanliness and least possibility of deterioration. It also means easier work for employees and lower cost to the consumer. With the other visitors, let's follow through the manufacture of just one of the breakfast foods produced here, puffed wheat. 
First, the grain goes through several cleaning processes that remove all foreign matter, then cleanse the kernels themselves and classify them according to size. A maze of funnels and pipes carry the wheat from one operation to the next, jiggling all the while to keep the grain moving. We've all heard about puffed wheat being shot from guns and taken it perhaps as just a figure of speech. But now we're about to see that the expression means just what it says. This gun, one of a long battery, is charged with grain. The airtight door is locked securely. The heat's turned on and the pressure builds up inside the kernels until when the door is opened, Our cameraman is covered with puffed wheat, but the trip to the breakfast table has hardly more than just begun. The newly exploded cereal drops immediately to the floor below to be graded again for size. Grains lacking the proper dimensions are screened out. The wheat has hardly stopped moving since it arrived here in Cedar Rapids, and it won't stop moving now until it's been shipped out. Although it's already full of nourishment, the cereal now moves along to be still further enriched in a spray treatment that literally rains vitamins on every kernel. After drying and cooling, the puffed wheat is ready for packaging. It drops down through another funnel to the packaging room that contains probably the most amazing collection of mechanical equipment to be found in this modern plant. A precisely measured quantity pours into each box. The cereal is tamped to assure full measure. Then the top is closed and sealed. Truly a sight to bring wonderment to the eyes of not just the young alone. Daily, millions of Americans of all ages who happen to take a guided tour of an industrial plant have reason to be startled by the sweeping advances that have come about since they last saw one of our industries close up. The modern house of marvels. Its attractions as a showplace are on a par with its contributions to the well-being of the community and the nation. What veteran of World War II can't remember that workhorse of the Army, the 6x6 truck? At first glance, this might look a lot like the vehicle that became familiar throughout the world. But the much more powerful 6x6 General Motors is building for Army ordnance these days has a lot of features its older brother of a bygone era never dreamed of. For example, special sealing features that make the truck impervious to water for landing and deep fording operations. Even in water deep as this, its six-wheel drive lets it make time. Now, equipped with a snorkel that keeps exhaust and air intake above water, and with diving equipment on the driver, we're going to see the truck that's practically a submarine. Up periscope and stand by for a dive. Poor fellow didn't pay attention to the sign, roadway slippery when wet. Now all he wants to know is, where's the roadway? A fish's eye view of an important new contribution by the automotive industry to the most highly mechanized defense team any nation ever had. If Americans lined up all their passenger cars, bumper to bumper, the procession would be some 125,000 miles long, enough to stretch across this country 40 times. And the resulting traffic jam would look something like this. Just one example of the living standard we in this nation enjoy. With only 6.5% of the world's population, Americans own 76% of the world's passenger automobiles proof that our nation has been able to outproduce all other countries by remaining free. A 
out of the Press Steel Car Company plant in Chicago rolls the answer to a crying need for permanent type houses that can be easily moved. These are the units that make up a five room and bath structure called the Uni Shelter, on their way by ordinary truck to the building site, which could be practically anywhere on earth. Built entirely of sheets of laminated plywood molded together with special plastics under tremendous pressure and heat, they're delivered from the factory with everything in place, kitchen and bathroom fixtures, plumbing and power outlets. Foundations are either wood posts or, as in this case, concrete, depending on local conditions. But though the Unis shelter does have a foundation, it remains movable, for it's connected to the foundation by bolts. Thus defense production officials can get the housing in a hurry they need, even in remote areas, while at the same time providing workers with real homes, suitable for families with as many as four children. Plumbing, water, gas, and electricity are all easily connected to the supply systems at fittings on the outside of the Unis shelter. With the interior of the house already complete, the moving men can start bringing in the furniture while the translucent Corolux roof is being installed over the terrace. The manufacturer expects to market the Uni Shelter in projects for less than $8,000. Even before Pop gets home from work, the family is not only moved in, but a couple of neighbors have dropped by to get acquainted. Mother's speed in settling down in her new home is right in line with the speed of the builder in producing this unique house, with almost the movability of a trailer and all the comforts of a permanent home. on parade. A pictorial review of events in business and industry produced each week by the National Association of Manufacturers. A landmark at Battle Creek, Michigan. The humble structure in which, more than half a century ago, a man named C.W. Post got the breakfast food industry off to a flying start. Today, vast grain elevators are needed to hold the raw materials that go into the products C.W. Post started to develop back in 1895. Among them, Post Toasties. Let's follow along and see how that familiar food is made. First, corn grits go into the cookers, the kernels being softened and prepared for further processing by high temperature steam. As they emerge from the cookers, the grits have merged into lumps and now must be broken apart. This is partly accomplished by tumbling them in machines called lump reels. After that, it's a drying under blasts of hot air. The individual kernels now go through a process called tempering to prepare them for flaking. Now they're ready to be rolled into the thin corn flakes everyone knows so well. Pressure of 18 tons per square inch flattens them out to a diameter of half an inch or more. And here's where they put the toast in post toasties, in long ovens that turn them a golden brown and give them a slight curl and their characteristic crispness. As soon as they've cooled, they'll be packaged under the most modern and, of course, sanitary techniques. The post cereals division of General Foods, pioneer in the field of breakfast cereals, is not resting on past laurels. In their unending efforts to make the morning meal more delectable, they've recently introduced such new products as crinkles, 
candy-kissed rice, and Sugar Crisp, a candy-coated puffed wheat that can be eaten without sugar out of the box. Typical of the ever more nutritious products being turned out by one of America's great food industries. For generations from the four corners of the world, people came to America to live under a way of life that gave them the spiritual satisfactions which could be realized only under personal freedom. Here they found religious freedom, political freedom, academic freedom, which has meant better education for all, and finally, economic freedom. A private enterprise system which has enabled all of us to attain the highest standard of living known to man. Opportunity, which has given us the personal choice of where we wanted to work and at a job of our own choosing. Each of us must guard those freedoms which have made America great. Buried beneath these hills of Floyd County, Kentucky, lie deposits of some of the richest coal for steel making to be found anywhere. Coal that will be transformed into coke for steel furnaces should be low in ash. And while the coal that comes out of this region is inherently low in ash, even that wasn't low enough to satisfy officials of the Inland Steel Company like Jack Price. Price, who heads Inland Steel operations in, around, and under the town of Wheelwright, directed a modernization program, now helping to bring us better steel, cheaper steel, and more steel without the erection of new steel-making facilities. The modernization program began with the introduction of mechanical underground mining methods. Formerly, these miners blasted, shoveled, and pushed the coal out by hand. Now they mine it by machine and send it out in the cars that carry them to their jobs underground. Mechanical digging makes it possible to work mine areas. It would not be economical to work by hand, but it also creates some problems. The machine loader can't pick out the slate and other impurities in the coal as the miners used to do. Also, in exploiting seams that once would have been left alone, it brings out a higher percentage of unwanted materials. So, Inland Steel's experts went to work on the problem and devised methods for separating the impurities and cleaning the coal itself to further reduce its already low ash content. The answers they came up with spelled freight savings, increase in the byproducts of coke, greater blast furnace efficiency, and most important, an increase in production of the urgently needed pig iron and steel. The coal starts through its processing at the rate of 750 tons per hour, thanks to the latest material handling methods. After being rotary dumped into the hopper, it goes to a device that's a screen, a picking table, and a conveyor belt all in one. Experts snatch out by hand pieces of rock and slate. Tramp iron is removed automatically by magnets. And as it moves down the mountainside, the coal contains fewer and fewer impurities. It also becomes graded according to size. Finally, it ends up in the wash boxes. Here, the stream of raw coal passes over a perforated plate and is subjected to alternately upward and downward currents of water. This not only cleans it, but causes the lighter coal to rise to the top, while heavier substances like clay, rock, slate, and so on settle to the bottom from where they can be diverted to refuse bins. So out comes the clean, pure coal, better coal and more of it, produced by men who would not be stopped by the difficulties they met in their determined efforts to keep in step with progress. The heart of the cotton belt, the deep south. This Alabama countryside was the scene of gracious living in years gone by, and though it fell on hard times, it's proving that the climate, the soil, and the temperament of its people are as suitable for gracious living in this century as in the last. Industry on Parade cameramen arrive at the Alabama town of Sylacauga to see just how people in these parts do live. One thing certain, there's nothing sleepy about it. Same stores, same activity you'll find in any thriving, bustling American town, north or south, east or west. And you don't have to hunt very far to find one force behind the healthy, flourishing life of Sylacauga. 
It's a healthy, flourishing industry called Avondale Mills that takes in the raw Alabama cotton and transforms it into a variety of finished products needed by people everywhere. From the opening machines, the cotton is sent along to pickers where it's partially cleaned, emerging in the form of a loose blanket called lap. On the card, thousands of fine wire teeth will comb out additional foreign matter and begin to lay the fibers parallel to each other. Then begins the process of drawing the fibers out. Six strands are fed onto a roll that moves just six times as fast as the feeding rolls. And after being drawn and spun again and again, the yarn is finally ready for the loom. Large rolls will feed the warp or lengthwise strands, while the crosswise or filling yarns are laid in by bobbins that shuttle back and forth as the warp yarns are raised and lowered. This particular fabric is corduroy, and disc blades cut the grooves called whales. Now into the sanforizing machines that'll pre-shrink the fabrics. It's in this way that many of the people of Silicaga spend their working days, applying special skills to the handling and processing of a fiber that's special to their part of the country. And for that matter, the town of Silicaga and Avondale Mills are something special too, for they've created more than just another boom town. Here, the roots go deep. The Comer family that founded Avondale Mills wanted things like swimming pools for the kids. It wanted pleasant accommodations for visitors. It wanted a good library to open new worlds to seeking minds. It wanted the finest medical care obtainable for every member of the community. Not only attention for the sick, but preventive medicine for the healthy the best there was. Juvenile delinquency, hardly among boys like these, boys whose natural vitality finds a natural outlet and wins awards for achievement. Yes, it was inevitable that a prosperous industry would help bring prosperity to everyone in town. That's the way things work. Not only do literacy rates go up and sickness rates go down, but there's enough left over for what some people might look upon as plain frivolity. But where the roots really go deep are in the home. And thanks in large part to a company financing program, Today, 85% of Avondale employees own their own homes. Many of them are farm homes, where the owners grow food for their own tables and find a happy combination of the best in city and country life. Truly a company that's found a partnership with the people. Every American feels the effect of inflation. Housewives feel it when they try to stretch the family budget. The government realizes it when it goes to buy the materials for defense. Businessmen run into inflation in higher labor and material costs. Inflation means more money in circulation than goods available to buy. It's caused when our government spends more money than it takes in through taxes. The way to curb inflation is to produce more goods, increase productivity, turn out more for every hour worked. And the government must cut unnecessary spending curb private and public credit, and put all essential defense spending on a pay-as-we-go basis. Hard to believe, but here's a factory in New York City that can turn out 5,000 tanks and 10,000 jet planes in a single day. Working with classified blueprints from the Defense Department, the Comet Metal Products Company can produce 5,000 ships, 2,500 trucks and 500 artillery pieces at the very same time. If you haven't already guessed, the tanks, planes, ships and guns produced here are miniatures. But they aren't toys, and they are perfect scale models made from the blueprints of the real thing. There can be no mistake about any detail, for these miniature instruments of warfare will serve an important purpose. 
They'll be used in training our fighting men to distinguish friendly ships, planes, and tanks from those of the enemy. Also in helping the high brass to recreate the picture of a military situation many miles away, giving them a three-dimensional view of an operation. During World War II, the little Comet Metal Products plant was under a 24-hour security guard, and the precautions once more are beginning to tighten up. How any small boy would like to be turned loose in this factory. But this is serious business. And when Uncle Sam says, send us more tanks, more ships, more planes, he isn't kidding. For in their own way, these tiny models of the genuine article can also help save the lives of American fighting men.